Hello and welcome to Be Curious Beans podcast. I'm your host, Seven Yielders. Are you curious about the natural world with its abundant ecosystems and diverse environments? Perhaps you're interested in behaviours, evolution and communication? Then this is the place for you. Along the way, I'll be speaking with conservationists, scientists and naturalists within the world of conservation science to bring you all the hidden gems and wildlife facts. So, come along and join me on this curious journey about the place that we live on. You are the first guest of season three, so this is amazing. So thank you very much. Um, okay, so hi, Alicia. Thank you so much for coming to my podcast this evening. How have you been? Um, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited to be on your podcast. So thank you so much for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure. I, I can't wait to start talking to you about all your artwork because I think it's absolutely incredible and uh, your little project that you did on your own. So I think an initial start, what I normally do is I just ask my guests what you're currently doing and what you've been up to. And especially during lockdown, it's been it's been a bit crazy, hasn't it? So what have you been getting yourself up to? Well, I just finished my degree in biology. So I sort of was focusing on that. Um, yeah, all done. <laughs> um, so I've been kind of, over the last sort of few weeks, everything I've just been sort of doing kind of some fun projects, so a bit of writing, a bit of art, quite a bit of photography. Um, and then I'm sort of preparing for starting a master's in September. So yeah, having a break before starting again. <laughs> That's a good plan. That's a good plan. So I think, so like, so what kind of like photography are you into and, and how have you managed to just get outdoors and see things that you like? Have you just grabbed a camera and just gone out and just taken anything that you can see? So I do lots of wildlife photography and um, I've done it for years. Like I got my first camera when I was three. So it's just something I always take my camera when I go out for a walk. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've taken one out today and I saw some butterflies, which is really nice. It's just a case of kind of opportunistically seeing what I can find <laughs> when I'm out and about. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I really love especially like invertebrates and birds. Like they're my kind of yes. main kind of things I like to do. <laughs> I find birds a little bit more difficult because I I want to take a really good photo of it but when I get my camera out it's already gone and I'm like <laughs> I, I could have taken a it's, good it's, photo of you yeah it's, it's the typical challenge isn't it about photography everything flying off as soon as, as you get your camera out um I was trying to photograph um, a blue butterfly the other day and honestly it was just all over the place <laughs> you couldn't focus I think it um, you had a camera <laughs> It's just luck, I think, a lot of the time, whether you can actually get them to stay still, I think. Um, yeah, every photographer's problem. <laughs> <laughs> Sit for hours mm -hmm. and get the shot you want. It's absolutely incredible. It's yeah, incredible. I, I think with mine as well, they tend to be just sort of, if I find something that isn't, you know, <laughs> moving a million miles an hour or sort of staying in the same location, I will kind of stay with it and just play around and see what I can get. Um, yeah, totally. that's definitely easier with um invertebrates as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's because they're so slow and they're like, oh, it's right yeah. here. <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. So, I mean, before we start on your research project that you did during lockdown, what are you? Uh, what what masters are you going into? So, I'm going to do a wildlife filmmaking masters at UE in Bristol. <laughs> I yeah. just I've just finished that one in Salford. No way! Oh, woo! What did you think? I'm serious. <laughs> It was okay. It was good. I mean, we did get hit by the pandemic. So I think yeah. the majority of the time we had to do it at home. Uh, oh, so man. I think we couldn't get camera equipment and mm -hmm. I think the facilities itself were closed down. So we chose, well, I chose to do a dissertation on how documentaries are implementing or changing people's opinions on plastic pollution, essentially that one, because oh, I'm nice. really interested in that kind of genre. I mean, it's quite depressing, but I think it kind of opened up my eyes a little bit more to see how much plastic we're actually using on a daily or like monthly basis. Yeah. yeah I've just finished that one. That's crazy. Oh, how cool. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, that's actually, awesome. I'm hoping to move down to Bristol very uh, soon. Well, in the near future, hopefully. So, awesome. <laughs> yeah. I bet you're excited. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I feel like, um, yeah, I'm getting more excited the closer it gets, but um. I've wanted to get into wildlife film since I was about 12 because of the start because of starting in photography. So um, yeah, it's really, I'm super excited about it. Oh, I'm excited for you. I can't wait. That's going to be amazing. So what kind mm -hmm. of like, production do you want to go into? Are you into editing, script writing, storytelling? What kind of things are you into? 
it's kind of tricky because I feel like I've not really um, explored Lesbia yet. Like I've done sort of short films, but I've done everything. <laughs> so and, I, and I'm I'm doing it with no training. <laughs> so I I, love that. I don't know. I I'm not sure if I'd want to. I don't know really. I I like the idea of doing filming. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if I'm good enough, but uh, hey, I like no. doing camera Every, work. So everybody is good at something, and. <laughs> some people have amazing hidden talents I can't tell you it's it's crazy some people they say I'm not really good at this but I'm like but when I see their work it's it's incredible so never what what bit are you interested in (laughs) I'm interested in researching because I am sticking my head in a book or going on the internet and just researching scientific papers so if I can hopefully um get some (laughs) researching that would be amazing so yeah yeah but that's amazing oh my god Mm -hmm. (laughs) so I think now to the really really cool stuff uh I'm really excited to understand how you actually did this uh during a period where everyone was stuck at home so (laughs) how did you come across this this mini project of yours and and what kind of elements did you bring into it given the fact that you know it was locked down and I mean the only source of material was I guess the outdoors and the internet so how did you cope with that well so for some context like our our degree we didn't have a dissertation we were meant to have a dissertation <laughs> it got turned into a grant proposal but um I would sort of planned my project before and because my project was looking at how caterpillar camouflage affects avian predation and it just required me making little models out of lard and so I contacted my supervisor and I was like well I could just do this in my garden because it's you know it's of fiber to get all of the material I need and um he said yeah go for it and and use it for like to back up the rest of your coursework essentially that's amazing um yeah so that's how I kind of (laughs) just got permission and then kind of got the risk assessments changed from my house and um yeah then then I made all these little models that are about so big um and it was all based on there's this guy called Innes Cuthill and that's it he did the kind of initial research on um caterpillar camouflage looking at like crypsis So um, we kind of were doing a kind of follow-up, I guess, like sort of looking at different kinds and how that affects avian predation. Mm. So it was really interesting. Um, And and I think it was probably the only experiment you could have done, at least that um, I know that you could have done (laughs) in your garden, (laughs) which is lucky. That's very true. I mean, it's very strange, isn't it, how I, I guess during a period of time when things are kind of not as you kind of, you know, they're not as your normal day-to-day routine let's say or like it's so unusual but it's unusual and kind of things like this but um there's so much material outdoors and that's the most incredible thing I didn't realize I didn't realize that until I had to I think one of the projects that our degree uh, said that we had to do was macro and be like you know just find things find things and I was like well I what what does this what does this mean and when I when I came home I was like well I have a garden and with any small green space, there's something you can find. And I yeah. ended up digging for earthworms. <laughs> it's amazing what you can find there. Like, I think with macro photography as well, you know, you, I was spending quite a lot of time during lockdown doing it in my garden. And it was just, it's extraordinary. You sit in one little patch and so much comes past you. And it's just, it's amazing. It blows mm-hmm. my mind, the invertebrate world, honestly. <laughs> yeah. There's actually a question I want to ask you about your, about your artwork, but I will get to that. But uh, so when you so because you you've done macro photography and you mm-hmm. see all of this amazing detail that you wouldn't normally see if you did a long a long shot or a wide shot. I'm guessing that inspires you, doesn't it? Just when you see Definitely. all the like, colorations and patterns that you can use that in your artwork. A hundred percent. I was saying I, I was chatting to my partner about this the other day because I was saying like doing photography it means you you have such a kind of a focus like there's so much attention through the lens like you see so much and then when you're trying to kind of draw that and reproduce it in artwork even if you're not drawing the same thing it's it's just you're honing the same skills right it's the same kind of attention to detail yes and and the colors as well like Mm -hmm. I was drawing um well actually I I drew it before I saw it but I think um I saw a ruby tailed um wasp the other day and I'd never seen one before. And I was so excited because I literally had been <laughs> drawing one the week before. That's and I was just thinking how amazing it was because 
you know, what a colorful invertebrate to have in the UK. It's just extraordinary, right? And then to see one, and I was just, the, the first day I looked at how small it was, but they're so beautiful and bright. And it was just, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. I love, I love that. And the thing is like, you don't, I guess, well, I never realized I've never seen a kestrel. You know, I've seen it on TV and I've seen photos, mm-hmm. but to physically see one in the wild or like in nature, or like on a nature walk, I think I fangirled so much. Uh, and I know when you're supposed to see a bird, I guess, like, you know, you've got to be quiet and just be respect, be respectful of, of the outdoors. And I was just like, oh, my God. Is it- <laughs> um, did you, was it the size? Did you think it was like, were you expecting it to look how it did? You know, I, it was smaller than I expected. Mm-hmm. It's so much smaller. I was like, why is it bigger? What happened? <laughs> it's weird with birds. Because I remember when I saw my first kingfisher, when I was probably about maybe 12. A kingfisher? I, yeah, um, but I saw one when I was 12 and I was just blown away because I thought it was so small and I was like, I thought they'd be big. <laughs> I love that. I <laughs> one. Oh, wow. Well, oh, they're really, I, I think the one thing, once once you've seen, well, once you've heard them, once you've heard the call once or twice, you get your ear in and then it becomes a lot easier because they've got this really... It's unlike any other bird song, really, because it's just this really piercing whistle. Ooh. And once you've heard that a few times, you'll start kind of noticing it, and then you'll be like, whoa, they're everywhere. Like, <laughs> yeah, oh, just along with it. <laughs> I love that. I mean, mm-hmm. I what did I see recently? I saw a, a common turn. Is that how you pronounce it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so it's like an E-R-N, T-E-R-N. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, yeah, that's definitely a black-headed gull. <laughs> because it looks so similar but it's a lot yeah. slimmer so then because I recently bought like a nature book so I went mm. back and I took in the colors and took in the patterning around the bill and the head and I was like hang on a second this is no way. <laughs> and when I found out it was the turn I was I was just so fascinated that yeah that we have them and like each season just brings in so many different species mm-hmm. I guess all of this is just such inspiration for your artwork yeah, definitely. And, and I think just sort of, not just like illustration work, but kind of photography and film and everything, because it's just it's so exciting, like the natural world. Like, it's just extraordinary. There's just so, there's so much. <laughs> this is why, I, I, this, I guess this is probably the reason why you and me actually want to get into the industry, because it's just so, there's just so much abundance that you can, mm-hmm. you can learn from and you can create so many different stories and yeah, just inspire so many different people about what is outdoors. Not, I mean, because not necessarily everyone gets the chance to actually go out and spend a couple of hours sitting and just listening out for the birds or just looking at the I don't know looking at the fish or things like that Mm. but I guess if if people like us have the opportunity to to give that I think that's just extraordinary yeah yeah I agree I think especially people have become more aware of it since lockdown as well so realizing the importance of the natural world and seeing seeing green spaces and wildlife I think people have become much more aware of its importance and value which is really lovely (laughs) totally agree on that so I think getting back to your project uh what made you choose camouflaging caterpillars um I honestly I was thinking about this and I was thinking I feel like it was just something we kind of me and my supervisor were both discussing it and I feel like he kind of suggested Ines Cuthill as, as someone he knew who'd done research and I thought thought oh that's really cool and I think as well part of me really liked the fact that I'd have to make the models and paint them and I feel like my artistic side was like yeah let's make some models <laughs> so I think it was because it mixed <laughs> science and art just as a concept yeah. and I just really liked the because I could do both so um, yeah <laughs> I love that so much I mean because it's such a great way of it's a great way of learning because some people learn visually and then some people learn physically mm-hmm. so what better way to do that is to create something from mold and learn from it on the process I think that's such a great way for conservation and it's so easy mm-hmm. too like yeah get like documentaries and programs are, are are important and easy to follow some would say some can mm-hmm. be quite confusing some can be a little bit misunderstood but I think if you're physically getting into making something from scratch I think that's a brilliant learning process mm-hmm. to understand what species it is 
the importance of it and then taking in the colors and taking in the anatomy of it will mm-hmm. only later on help you understand if you see it in the wild or in nature I think that's incredible yeah <laughs> I really enjoyed sorry I'm really enjoying this I'm just like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> me too don't worry it's so much fun um so I guess with camouflage you know camouflage we know it's such an important strategy for so many different species from butterflies to birds you know to insects so in your opinion because I would love to hear your opinion on it why do you think camouflage is is so important for species to strategize this in 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 the wild I mean I think survival and survival to reproduce is like absolutely key because if if you've got a bit of a rubbish camouflage you're just going to get eaten (laughs) and and ultimately (laughs) yeah I know and ultimately you will need everyone needs to kind of reproduce because that's the sort of Mm. I guess that's a part of being alive right you need to pass on your genes and and that's sort of the fundamental to being alive and I think camouflage is key and there's so many the the thing about my experiment was I looked at the different kinds so I looked at um like warning colors like in ladybirds um and then I looked like yeah yeah disruptive disruptive camouflage which is like the stripes on zebras is sort of black and white confusing um I looked at a novel color which was blue um (laughs) um yeah and it's a control which was green because most caterpillars, well, not most caterpillars, but you find a lot of green caterpillars. Yes. And then I did, yeah, novel camouflage, which was military. So I kind of did a mixture of dark, light green and uh, yellow and sort of mixed them together. Um, and that was sort of to look at kind of how different forms of camouflage affect survival, because mm-hmm. obviously all of the camouflage types work mm. um, yeah. for different animals as well. So I think ultimately it's about ensuring that they do reproduce but it's so interesting that there are so many different kinds of camouflage for animals to achieve that if, if that makes sense like <laughs> it's so true yeah. I mean there's uh there's so many that I've I think the most surprising group that has kind of fascinated me, fascinated me a lot is frogs yeah because they change color because of the warning colors as well I find I don't know why I find that more fascinating than birds but I find that incredibly fascinating because each mm-hmm. obviously each pattern or or the, the kind of like the structure of the of the patterns are either warning or a sign of let's say they've seen danger or it's mm. to hide themselves it's mm-hmm. it's something that fascinates fascinates me a lot and I'd love to do so much more research on it because <laughs> it's just incredible I mean there's so much yeah. and how I guess how species use this to advance their protective or their survival skills is is so much more advanced than what we thought it was, which is incredible. <laughs> I think as well with um like with birds, like with precocial chicks, like more more lots of moorland birds, and mm-hmm. the fact that they look very different from their adults because obviously you know they hatch their walking and everything, and and they have to be so yes. perfectly camouflaged. And I don't know if you've ever tried to look for um like chicks like on the moor like oh, no. um. And you just can't see them. You like, you won't see them until you're right next to them. Like, you know, on a walk and you'll see these little balls of fluff crouched down next to rocks and grasses. And, you know, you <laughs> you just walk past them if you weren't looking, you know. I can't because it's I, quite extraordinary. I find chicks so, so adorable. <laughs> so- Baby curlies are so sweet. They have such big feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love, I love, um, so recently I saw some moorhen chicks. Mm-hmm. They are adorable because the way that they run, it's a, it's really cute. So they run like face first <laughs> and then the feet are trying to keep up with the bodies. But I think coots, I think coots win it for yeah. sure because they're, they're kind of like webbed, webbed little feet and it's, it's the best <laughs> The adult coots always remind me a bit of, um, you know, like plague doctors with the, the big white bill. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So, because I, I was, I was, I was kind of like, when I was reading your message and stuff about how you did camouflage in caterpillars, I was like, oh, you're, you're collecting them, surely. And I figured, well, okay, this would be a great time to ask about like what kind so what kind of like to do re- referring to their, their camouflage how did that 
get you curious about their behaviors and and how did that get you into understanding why caterpillars are so like, essential in you know in let's say the trophic chain let's say like in mm. with within an ecosystem i think because so the, the key thing is i didn't collect the live caterpillars <laughs> Um, so I was mainly looking, I guess, at sort of how birds were responding to them because Ooh. I was making these models and I didn't want to, to sort of, because to start with, I was thinking, oh, I'll mimic species that actually exist and I'll make sort of cinnamon moth caterpillars and things like that. And then my supervisor pointed out that if I do that, I'm not going to get any results because obviously all the birds know what cinnamon moth caterpillars taste like, they're going to taste horrid. So that's why I had to come up with these different designs. Ah. and ones that probably don't exist but mm -hmm. are sort of like things that exist mm -hmm. um and I guess what I found out was I think the most interesting thing I found out was in my sort of because it's a preliminary study so I can't draw any concrete conclusions but that um <laughs> the blue caterpillars were sort of an unusual color and the birds hadn't really seen them before so mm -hmm. at the start of the experiment they ignored them they weren't getting eaten there were no pecs you know they just sit they were really easy to see but they would just sit there and by the end of the experiment, the sixth week, they were going straight away, they'd be gone at midday, they were preferentially taking off the blue caterpillars because they were easy to see and obviously they're large, so they birds had learned so that they taste funny. nice. Um, <laughs> How so, yeah. How so I think if you don't taste, if you're not actually a sort of dist, um, yeah, and, and if you don't taste, yeah, sorry, hang on. If you're distasteful um, and you're also brightly coloured, then it's a sort of awful combination because you're going to be predated at a much higher rate. Yeah. It's incredible. I love how, I guess I like, I, it's just so fascinating how mm -hmm. species can change its behaviour in order to advance itself. Or yeah, the, the speed they change as well, the birds, the fact that it was six weeks and then six weeks they learn we can preferentially go for these blue ones because they taste nice. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. how did that? How did that fascinate you? Because I mean, I mean, I would have kind of, I would have written all of this down because this is such, <laughs> such great material for, you know, for short documentaries for short films. Mm. I mean, it all went into my grant proposal. So um, my grant proposal was instead of the dissertation, because um, that's what everyone in my year did. And so that was essentially sort of a theoretical if this project was three years. So for all of this, I kind of made some little graphs. And obviously, it's all preliminary data. You can't draw any concrete conclusions because it was only six weeks. Yes. But in my data, I sort of show it. And I'm saying, well, if we continue this, then there's two possibilities with blue caterpillars. Either they will just forever be neophobic of them, and they'll ignore them. Mm -hmm. or they might have this sort of curve where to start with they don't go for them and at the end they do and and, and that would be really interesting to see if that happens basically mm -hmm. like the idea that we could condition <laughs> accidentally condition birds to preferentially eat things <laughs> that is so good that is so cool i mean i've i've we've definitely um we definitely learn about conditioning but i think not to the extent of wild species and it's <laughs> yeah. like you know you can't you the the, the i mean there's an ability to do that mm. but I think under under research and scientific elements I think I think it would be incredible to understand why they prefer mm. we might we, was... we could assume that it's because they're distasteful or because of the color but mm. the, why they prefer them would be something incredible to find out yeah I guess I guess because as a sort of blue caterpillar it's easy to see mm. and when they know it's not you know harmful for them and it tastes nice then I guess it it's probably quite easy for them to learn and, and create that pathway neural pathway in their head to think well blue caterpillar equals tasty and food yes but obviously in, in nature normally that's probably not going to happen because if a caterpillar is being eaten <laughs> to the extent that my little models were it's going to go extinct quite fast unless it quickly changes <laughs> its, um, <laughs> yeah attitude <laughs> physiology <laughs> I, 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 I just love how your mini project is, is kind of panned out. I just love how that, I mean, we never really, I mean, I guess with our degree, because of what happened with lockdown, we never really thought of something to, like to physically go out and do that. Mm. I think that would have been such a great little research project for like many, many students to do during 
during such a, a kind of a very weird time. <laughs> so you've kind of like, you know, you've pioneered this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, garden experiments. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. So because I actually said that I find frogs fascinating, what other kind of camouflages have you found fascinating or what do you find fascinating in general? This doesn't have to be a part of any project or anything, just just a very fun question to ask. <laughs> I mean, in, in camouflage, I think I definitely love avian camouflage because I think there's so much diversity and it always has such a distinct purpose as well, which I find really satisfying because mm -hmm. like, you know, chicks will be camouflage because, you know, they're, they're babies, they're, if, if they're precocial, they're fairly like prone to getting away from their parents. And obviously out of males and females, females are normally more camouflage because they're the ones that are breeding. Um, but then you've got things that like completely break them all, like um, birds of paradise are a really oh. <laughs> notable example. <laughs> so None of them are camouflage. They're yeah. so bright and colorful. Mm -hmm. it's so I think, and then sort of more generally, I'm really interested in like light pollution on birds and then um, um, noise and marine pollution and yeah, marine pollution in the, in the ocean. So like with that light or noise or plastic, I think light pollution on birds is something that I'm, I'm definitely interested in just because I think it's something that hasn't, I don't know, I'm not sure how much research has been done on it, but it feels like something that more research could definitely be done on and, and more could be done Mm. by sort of the general public to kind of act on it as well so I think that's a very interesting area <laughs> so was so was light pollution within Avery's was that something that you've grown to love over time or was that because of your undergraduate and other experiences where you found it quite fascinating um I feel like I've always been really interested in birds so sort of seeing and I think it was one of the first essays I ever wrote when I started my degree looking at, it, it was an optional one, not an optional one, it was one where we got to choose our own topic. And I thought, oh, I quite like to do one looking at how light affects birds. Mm. Um, and um, I just started researching artificial light at night and, and the impact of sort of high rise buildings that are being lit up and, and how they're sort of dazzling birds. And, and, and yeah, I, I think birds are kind of one of the most interesting kind of taxa for me. I've always been really intrigued by them um and especially bird senses as well um uh, like like the book bird senses by Tim Burkett is really interesting if, if anyone's interested in it but um yeah. yeah so looking at how the bird senses are affected by light was just really fascinating I feel like it's just something I've remained interested in but because it's not really it was never covered by my degree so I think as well it was just something I would dip into if I had a sort of a free essay where I could do something anything I wanted I tended to sort of pursue that I think <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I would totally do that and I think with I think when you're going on to your masters I think that would be a great project to do because mm. it, it's so informative it's important and I guess it's highlighting all of the I guess how we've uh, evolved over time we've created mm -hmm. high-rise buildings and we've created these street lamps and we've created all of this artificial light to allow yeah. and help us, I guess, during, I, I mean, our commutes, our work, or like all of these things that allow us to help are mm. somehow affecting species of all in some way. And I think yeah. that would be an incredible short film to make. So I think you should stick to that. That'd be really <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely something I'm I'm interested in, not just for birds as well, but thinking about the sort of wider effects because it does light pollution does affect even humans because it affects the way we sleep and our circadian rhythms and there's so much we don't know about light pollution and I think it's and I think lots of people forget about it as well, and like the, the forget it's an issue. Yeah, um, <laughs> like many things, I think. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think we've become so accustomed to. I guess daily lives that we mm -hmm. we forget, don't we? We forget like what has kind of helped us or what's around us. And I yeah. think that's probably one of the things why I want to try and get into the industry is because I want to try and do this. I want to try and inspire people that you know, if you take five minutes, you can see, you can find anything, mm -hmm. and you'll be able to 
be anything. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I think getting more people to understand or like to see that even if you're looking up to the sky, I'm pretty sure you'll see a bird <laughs> fly yeah. past you. And that, <laughs> that might intrigue you a little bit about what is really out there. I think it's a really interesting and such a cool way to learn so many different things. Mm -hmm. so much. I, I don't want to say, I'm just like, how do I get it out? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's all the fact that you can show people how they can make a difference as well. And because there are loads of things out there, like loads of organizations, like and, and, and sort of events and things like yes. for light pollution, there's Earth Hour, which is every year. And I think that lots of people might just not know about it. And I think using film or art or photography or sort of anything really that engages with the general public to, to tell people about things yeah that totally. they may not know about but would happily get involved with. I think that's really important too. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think another thing that I that intrigues me so much is, is just the, like the ocean, like marine, mm. intrigues mm. me so far that I wish I knew more about it. And me too. <laughs> because there's, there's so, I mean, in itself, it's just a different world altogether. And yeah, do you remember that there was um, in, in Blue Planet 2, they had that like saltwater lake at the bottom of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was extraordinary. Yeah. Like, if if I could if I could I really really would uh, <laughs> just to learn about everything I guess you know the I, there's so much and you know when you you've got so much to say and like nothing comes out that's literally me mm. right now um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like I think the, the toxin the toxins the the acids that mm. plastics um, permit off of off of one little object is is yeah. mind-blowing but it's it's mm -hmm. eye-opening uh, yeah I was reading as well like with plastics like yeah. you can have these little like bacteria that hitchhike on little plastic pieces and then they become invasive species and I think again it's just this other side of plastic pollution that's more than just sort of being more than just trapping animals and yeah um, and to be eating it there's, there's this invasive species risk as well and I think that's something we don't <laughs> I totally I definitely definitely agree with that and I think um for plastics it's such a it, it's hard to say it's a negative though isn't it because some people mm. in some countries or continents really rely on plastic because it's so cheap and mm. it becomes this kind of like 50 50 so negative and positive on both humans and species because like you said species adapt to these these weird objects in the ocean they hitchhike they transform mm. themselves into different environments become invasive species you know plastics can carry disease bacteria um mm -hmm. all of these things and it's i think it's trying to level out you know even though it's kind of it seems like it's more bad but in some ways like some some species are really adapting to it you know, ones that mm. don't necessarily get entangled or ingested. I think more of the smaller micro species that are, you know, sticking themselves to it and just making a little like environment for themselves. I think yeah, I guess it's it's quite opportunistic, isn't it? Like sort of all invasive species, they're they're invasive for a reason. It's because they're successful, and, and the fact that they're sort of adapting to it faster. Yes, yeah, yeah. I definitely agree with that. It's all very, very strange. And that's why mm -hmm. I want to learn more about it. <laughs> <laughs> but the weirder the weirder the topic, great. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not what everyone else is doing. It's so different. It's so unique. And I think mm -hmm. I don't I don't actually I don't actually know if documentaries are pushing or sending a negative or positive message. So to watch plastic pollution and to watch plastic documentaries was not only quite sad and depressing, but it was very much educational and very informative mm -hmm. of, you know, why people use it and why was it made in the first place? And yeah. It's, it's kind of the same with me. At first, at first when I started researching it, I was like, oh no, no, this is really bad. You know, this can't happen. And then when I delve more into it, I kind of get it perspective and I understand it better. Mm -hmm. okay the reason why it was made is because it was you know it's highly adaptable it's you can mold it whichever way you please it's cheap it's, it makes life convenient 
but then it's not so convenient for the environment and for the toxins yeah. that it releases and how long it takes to degrade over time. So yeah. it's all those amazing little things that you learn along the way. Mm. So I, I guess that was how, when I guess that's the same for you when you were learning about light pollution. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It, it was sort of the severity of the situation and the kind of cascade of effects as well. The fact that it affects everything from physiology and, and your circadian rhythms all the way to like your behavior and, and like birds singing. Like that's a really quite mm. well-known example, especially if you visited a city and walked around at night and you find blackbirds singing extra street lamps at, you know, midnight. And it's, yeah, <laughs> crazy. It's so, so nice. I, I can't tell you how amazing it is to hear bird songs. Mm. How, like, how does it, I guess, how does it inspire you then? So when you hear a bird song, are you more likely to figure out what kind of species it is or are you happy just to delve into this, into this communication that they're making? I mean, I live in a really rural area, um, and so I'm really used to hearing bird song, um, mm. which is very lucky. And um, I, because I'm interested in birds, I do often try and identify the song. I'm, I can't do many, but I can do some. And mm. I like trying to kind of learn more. And I feel like lockdown actually helped because it gave me a bit more time, especially with your camera and everything. If you're finding the species, you can see them singing and it makes it a bit easier to learn. Um, I often find that bird song is very kind of relaxing and often really inspiring for artwork as well. Um, not just like illustration, but writing, because it kind of, I think it's just a kind of noise where it makes your mind kind of wander and sort of go to other places. And I, th I think that's really nice. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I totally agree. I love, <clears throat> excuse me, I love it when robins communicate. Mm -hmm. So noisy. But the, but the song is so kind of specific yeah. that, that you just know that it's a robin. Mm -hmm. I just, I love the sound of robins. I think they're just... Yeah. They're so I love song thrush because they're so, like, they have so much fun when they're singing because <laughs> you can just tell they're just playing and experimenting and, and mimicking and repeating and constantly improvising. They're just, they're like... The jazz musicians of bird it's amazing i just i really love them <laughs> that's so much oh <laughs> so we name every single bird in like accordance to how we feel <laughs> would be more i feel like i feel like yeah goldfinches always remind me i i remember their song because they're collected now and it's a charm and for some reason i think that they sound a bit like if you got keys and dang and jangled them in a, like a sort of nice way they kind of and that for me reminds me of the word charm it's 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 a weird one maybe if you listen <laughs> listen to them you'll get what I mean but um it's 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 so it's so relatable because I guess that's another way to learn a species isn't it mm -hmm. so I think it was a um chiff chaff here yeah yeah and how it how it actually sings it's like it's saying chiff chaff so mm -hmm that's how I've kind of referred back to learning species is to try yeah. and listen to the song and try and fit or try and get fit into how they how they how they uh, communicate and I find it yeah. rewarding sometimes it's like what species are you <laughs> <laughs> I think I think once you find whether it's like using collective nouns or using like the name and, and things like that finding something that kind of clicks with the species that's definitely how I mm. help remember remember them like I sort of think that wrens sound like kind of it's like a machine gun it's so fast and loud and frantic and, and I think once I've kind of got that in my head yeah. I, they're pretty pretty easy to remember <laughs> I love that I love that and it's such a, and like I said it's such a great way to learn different species definitely um, yeah so I think now is probably a really, really good opportunity to move on to your artwork. <laughs> so can you, because I would love to know how you got into it. So can you give me or give the audience more information about how, how it started and how you've really developed it and come into your own over the years? 
Well, I did art up to GCSE level, and it's something I've always really loved, drawing, um, wildlife especially. Um, and then I kind of stopped having formal training, but I kept sort of doodling. And I think when I did GCSE, that's got me what that's what got me really interested in using biro um, as a media. And then I kind of kept doing sort of bio on and off, just, you know, doing things for myself, really. And, and I quite liked copying things I liked. Um, and so I got quite good at kind of doing quite photographic things. And so when I started just experimenting drawing hairs again, I would I tried to do them in a photographic way using bio. And then I sort of enjoyed it and, and kept going. <laughs> yeah. And then when it comes to like, because I'd say my art is like in two different disciplines I guess like there's the sort of celebratory stuff which is like portraits mm. or ecosystems it's the kind of happy things and then there's the artivism like the wildlife artivism which is like um the whale piece um and when yeah when the whale sang and kind of ones that have a more powerful message um mm. that are kind of telling you something about that animal or the ecosystem or the environment and I feel like I, I sort of like using, I like doing both because I think for some people having a sort of celebration piece helps them connect with nature more and for others having something that says look this is what we're doing that that helps more and I think it's nice doing a mix. Yeah. Um, yeah with with my style I guess I don't know I, I feel like I really when I was sort of first started doing a lot of art and mm. it, it used to really bother me that I didn't have a style because I was like oh I, I don't know, you know, what is my style? I'm just copying. <laughs> and then I sort of, the more I've done it and the more I've kind of played around with the me media as well, I feel like I have lots of different kinds of styles for different things, depending on what I'm drawing and who I'm drawing it for. And and yeah, like it, it, I, I use my main media now, a kind of biro, ink pen, ink, watercolor and coffee. And I like using so a mix. Cool yeah so <laughs> I, I, love, I love that and I like how you said that you don't have a style and you go on the basis of I guess the person that you're drawing for or how you're feeling and that's so mm, definitely and that's so like on the point of art you're drawing on the basis of how you're feeling so the emotion that you're feeling is exactly how you're going to draw I think no one really has a style at all. Like, yeah, that, that is also something <laughs> I've sort of learned the more I've kind of delved into it. I feel like, yeah, I guess I guess my style is, is mixed. Um, I have lots of different ones depending on the occasion. And I think as well, like sort of going back onto kind of emotions and things, different pieces definitely need different media. Like um, my whale piece definitely needed bio. And other pieces I've done definitely needed what I did them in. And I think they look very different and have a real different feel to them if I did them in a different media, which is is, is interesting. I, I, I think that's quite cool. I I have to say, I loved your whale piece. Oh, <laughs> I can't even say how much I love it. I love Thank whales you. in general. Like, I just find them, there's something so, like, deep and so quiz inquisitive about whales that I just to more so than anything else mm -hmm. I I deeply love whale species and I think oh, it was just phenomenal on that it was just mm -hmm. fantastic. so well done to that and I think just like a follow-up question to what I asked you is that I guess your purpose of doing drawing is it is it for your personal development is it for self-gain is it for educational purposes what kind of things do you like to show your artwork and so what kind of purposes do you use it for? I'd say I'd say it's definitely for education like I do it for me because I enjoy it but mm. I also do it because I want to kind of say something and and I think I guess like I a good example is this is I like self-published a poetry book last year called Rain Before Rainbows and I illustrated it and so I was kind of pairing illustrations with poems and all of it was because I wanted to show people I wanted to show people the natural world and also what we were doing to it and kind of raise awareness for conserving it. Yes. Um, and so I had pieces like um, When the Whale Sang with its accompanying poem and that was all kind of quite negative and, and but but hopefully in a way that spurs people to do something about it. But then I had really celebratory poems and sort of just kind of nice portraits and, and sort of things like that. And I feel like it's, whenever I draw, it's definitely, I, I want someone to feel something and whether they feel 
like they've learned a new species or whether they feel inspired to protect the natural world, like any, any kind of positive feeling. That's, that's what I want people to get from my work, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> how long does it take you? Like how, so to get from, let's say, a person asks you for a piece of artwork, how, mm -hmm. what, what is the process of, <laughs> from start to finish? Um, I guess it sort of depends. Like normally, so I do quite a bit of the illustration work for Blue Moon Doom, which is an environmental magazine. Mm. Um, and so I guess when they ask me to do something, I will normally sketch out something in pencil quite quickly and just run it past them and say, you know, is this the kind of thing you're after? Mm. And if it is, then I just go for it. If it's not, I will tweak it and kind of go back to them. Yeah. And then the next stage is definitely, so when I sketch it out, well, first, <laughs> first I'll read the article, <laughs> then I sketch it out. Yes. Um, and then when I'm reading the article and sketching, I'm thinking like what kind of media and therefore what style, how am I presenting it? So sometimes they come to me and they say, we want it in this kind of style or we're thinking this kind of thing. So I had a piece recently, which was for um, the podcast Coffee with Conservationists. Ooh. So they wanted it in coffee, um, which is quite fitting. Um, <laughs> and then sometimes I have a free reign and it's whatever I fancy. And so then I guess I just kind of use my judgment as to what I think will benefit the piece the most. So sometimes I've done really colorful pieces where especially if they're quite happy, it's like positive pieces. Mm. And if it's people, I tend to do them in fairly like stylized, just ink, pen. Um, so, so, so there is sometimes a kind of common theme, especially okay. if I have to draw people, I tend to always do them like that. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think as well, I quite like getting things like that because I feel like I experiment a bit more when I have a sort of prompt, especially if it's one that I haven't, I wouldn't do normally. Like, um, I was illustrating air pollution for Lahore. Oh, um, in, wow. Yeah, and I was really stuck for a while about how to do that because I didn't want to do, I wanted it to show the colors of like the sand and the place, but it's also really difficult to show the air pollution. Mm -hmm. And so I did a piece with dots and, and ink and things and they liked it, but they were like, mm, it could be stronger. And so then I kind of go back and I'm thinking, hmm, okay. And so I added a faint layer of white ink over the top to make it more misty. And I had two versions and then we animated them into a GIF. Um, so they had two versions, two stills, and then a GIF showing the kind of pollution looping, which was quite cool. And that was definitely not something I'd have thought of, but um, so it's, it's nice having it as a collaborative process. Yeah. I was, I was, I was going to ask you another question about that. So I guess to collaborate with people, how, because I, I mean you've already answered it but <laughs> the I guess the like I like before I, I previously said the when you bounce off people on so many different levels mm -hmm. does that even surprise you what you can create definitely like I so recently I was doing a collaboration with um Sophia um Shukova who um won wildlife Foster of the year a couple of years ago with what? a piece about um shark fin trade yes and so Martin Abeling had done a, his version of it last year. Mm -hmm. and I was doing my version of it this year. Mm -hmm. And we had a meeting where we sort of bounced ideas about what I could do. Because um, obviously it wants to be obviously linked to her piece, but it also wants to be in my style. And I had an idea to start with, and then we kind of tweaked it and threw in more ideas. And, and honestly, what, what we came up with in the end was quite different from what we had to start with, but mm -hmm. really cool. And I was really happy with what we came up with and then that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had all of us sort of mm. saying well I think we need this and I think yeah. we should do this and, and and it was yeah really cool <laughs> mm. that's that's incredible I mean mm -hmm. to have collaborations with so many different people only just improves or just inspires you more and I think mm -hmm. like having you on today and and listening to your passion and listening to what things you're interested in only just you know it really does enhance the the experience of the podcast for so many different people because people could think well you know I want to get into photography and I want to get into art and I want to get into conservation and this is such a great way I would love to know is how can the audience reach you so what can they where can they find your artwork how can they find you how can they contact you if they have any queries or any questions or just how in general, how you do your work and what inspires you. So how can they find you? 
So I have a website which I think is alyssiahaydenwildlife.zenfolio.com, but you should just be able to pop something like that into Google <laughs> and it should come up. Um, then the other ways you can kind of find me is on Facebook and Instagram, where I'm at Alicia Hayden Wildlife, and you can either drop me a message through either of those platforms or drop me an email through my website. Um, and yeah, and if you have any questions, then feel free to get in touch as well, because I'm very happy to answer any questions. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for, for coming on. I, again, I apologise for the, the tech problems, uh, <laughs> but we managed to pull through. So thank you so much, Alicia, for coming on and taking the time to be with me. It's been absolutely incredible. I have enjoyed every single minute of it. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for having me, because honestly, it's been, it's been so wonderful talking to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And if you would like to know more about any updates and following podcasts, please follow me at Be Curious Beings. I will leave the link in the description below. Thank you so much. And I look forward to you joining me on the very next Be Curious Beings podcast.